Hey everybody, welcome to Hotel Business's Hot Topics, a continuing virtual panel series. I am so happy to be back once again, hosting one of these sessions. I absolutely love working with the folks over at Hotel Business. Of course, you might know me. I'm Glenn Hausman. I do a lot of No Vacancy News, No Vacancy Live podcast, No Vacancy News Today, and Friday Night Audit is our comedy drinking show every Friday evening. But one of the things that I am most passionate about is making sure that everybody in hospitality is successful. And that's what today is all going to be about, understanding how you can optimize the F&B supply chain for profitability and sustainability. But more important, we can also talk about sustainability in general. Where are we today when it comes to that? How important is it to today's traveler? And what are some of the things that you can do to leverage opportunity within this realm? And in order to be able to do that, I got great panelists with me. We got John Secor, Senior Director, Head of Culinary with Integra. Brian Hanna, Manager Procurement, Sustainability, and Supplier Diversity with the Core. Megan Brummagin, she's the VP of Sustainability with Choice Hotels International. Of course, Dean Wendell, VP of Food and Beverage with Concord Hospitality. Our other panelists, Mr. Richard Garcia, having airplane troubles. He's on a plane. He's off a plane. The plane's broken. I don't know what's going on, but sadly, he cannot uh, join us today. But the good news is for the next hour, you're going to get to hear from all of these great panelists. And I'm going to let you know out there right now, those of you watching, ask your questions. This Q&A box right there for you. And we're going to try to get in as many of those as possible. Because listen, I know a lot about this stuff. These folks know a lot about this stuff. But we want to make sure that we're tailoring this conversation to helping empower you to be more successful with actionable insights. And if you want to follow up on this, of course, the video will be available and they're going to cover this hot topic section in the July issue of Hotel Business. You can find it at hotelbusiness.com as well as social media, LinkedIn and Twitter. And it will be also available on demand online. I want to thank Integra for being the sponsor of today's show. I really appreciate you doing that there, Integra, IntegraPS.com. All right, let's get started to it. Megan, I'm going to go to you right now, my uh, big brand friend over there. What's going on with sustainability of choice? How are you thinking about it? What are consumers interested in these days? Yeah, Glenn, you know, it's a great question. You know, one thing that we are seeing is that sustainability is no longer just a nice to have. Right. It's a business imperative. We are seeing consumer data that is saying more and more uh, consumers want to see hotels focused on sustainability. This is especially true amongst the younger generations, so those millennial and Gen Z travelers. And it's also true of corporate customers. So we have data that, that half of corporate RFP uh, or RFPs today are asking sustainability-related questions. And so hotels, as they're looking to capture that business, whether it's from you know, those younger generation travelers or those co corporate customers, uh, they need to take action to really walk the talk and show how they are implementing sustainability on property. Brian, you feeling the same way? Yeah, no, absolutely. So, you know, first off, just want to say thanks um, for having all of us. I'm really excited for this. Um, but, you know, to mirror what Megan was saying, um, I think it's really important now more than ever because it is something that customers, you know, they're not seeing it as a nice to have. It's a requirement when they travel. Um, you know, they don't want to, you know, feel like they're, harm in the community that they're visiting. They want to make sure they're having an impact um, that's positive. And, you know, that's something that I think we're really trying to drive as well is that whole idea of, you know, when you travel, you know, it should be something that is empowering the community you're visiting. Um, and then, you know, to Megan's point as well, it is something that we see um, come up quite often in corporate RFPs um, where you have major clients who, you know, they also want, they also have their own, um, vision. They have their own commitments that they've made to sustainability and diversity, and they're making decisions um, on which hotels or which companies they support based on those responses. Um, so it's something for the customers. It's something for corporate clients as well. Um, and then, as you know, a bigger part of that in, indeed is that it's important for the community that the hotels are, um, you know, they're dependent on, right? None of these hotels can succeed without the support of the community that they're in. Um, and that's something really important that, that needs to be developed and fostered. You know? Yeah, now, uh, uh, Dean, he's making a lot of good points out there. I just happen to have uh, recently done a show at West and Main, a beautiful property that you guys uh, have own ownership and are managing in Conshohocken, Pennsylvania. I actually just brought it up because I like saying Conshohocken. D 
Dean, <laughs> because I'm proud that I could pronounce uh, that. Um, you got a great food and beverage program there, and you can tell it's sustainability in the sense that the building itself was uh, repurposed as well as a new addition. So Concord must be focusing um, very much on the notion of sustainability generally and with food and beverage as well. Oh, absolutely, Glenn. And again, um, yeah, thanks, thanks for having me on and letting me be a part of this panel. It's uh, very exciting. So thank you for that. Uh, but sustainability is very important and it really yeah. does start with, you know, concept development and, and building. And, uh, you know, our, our development team does a great job going in and making sure that we keep as much as we can if we're repurposing a space. Um, but then when it coming into food and beverage, um, you know, like, like Brian was saying, it is really important to the uh, meeting planners and the event planners uh, that they have, they want to be able to take good news back and when they're making their decisions. If you can show them at the end of their event, what you were able to do on a carbon offset yep. um, report, which is, these are now becoming almost live time, and uh, you know, at the at the end of a three or four day session, you you could very well be able to give them a report that said, throughout this event, we saved X amount of trees. We had you know 385 pounds of of carbon offset, and wow. give them that report. It's a big deal. Yeah, that is a big deal. So, John, uh, let me bring it around to uh, to you. Uh, you're very focused on this, um, but before we get into the specifics, how has the hotel industry changed their thinking about sustainability when it comes to that realm of food and beverage over the last five, four or so years? Uh, yeah, absolutely, Glenn. And first, again, on behalf of Integra Procurement Services, what a pleasure to be here. It's an honor to be here with such a group of professionals. Thank you for the opportunity to be here. Thank you, Chef. Um, yeah, sustainability. First of all, sustainability is not an overnight project, right? Mm -hmm. And and all of the pros here all know what a project is to take on the behaviors to make these uh, foundational changes. Um, and uh, one of the statistics that aligns with what everyone is saying that we pulled from a first insight report that was done very recently is that 73% of Gen Zers are willing to pay more for services and products that have been highly influenced by sustainable practices and that can show that. You know, one of the behaviors I see now, and, and I'm hearing that sort of in everyone's vernacular, is take credit for it. You know, don't, there's no more being shy. I also read that recently about how we take ownership of our careers. The days of being shy are over, you know, and it's just good communication, but by golly, in menus and in my room, I'm I'm in hotels every week with you all probably, but um, show me, take take credit for what you're doing. I think it's important to communicate and catch the eye of those that this is really fundamentally important to. Uh, it'll help us as consumers and help us as professionals to make really wise decisions um, and, and communicate those great practices that we're all taking on. Interesting. Megan, how are you thinking about making those uh, decisions? Because you're not only affecting things happening at, at, for example, Choice Corporate, but the individual owners and operators in your franchisee family. So what do you think about? Absolutely. It's so important. And uh, I appreciate John's point about mm -hmm. behavioral change. So much of this is about changing mindset, but then also changing behavior. And so when we at Choice, we've got, as you pointed out, a very large system um, of many franchisees who represent different chain scale segments, different areas of the country, different areas of the world. Mm -hmm. And so our focus is really on how do we make this practical for them? How do we help show them what's in it for them? And a lot of time that comes down to the dollars and cents, right? It's about how does how do these efforts help them find cost savings and how does it help drive top line revenue? So a lot of our um, as we've been designing our sustainability program, a lot of our focus has been on that ROI question and right. how can we find those opportunities for franchisees that help to drive energy efficiency, maybe reduce their utilities costs, whether that's you know, electricity, natural gas, water, all of that is a great opportunity to drive savings. And in fact, just last year, 
um, electricity prices in the U.S. were, I think it was a 14% increase in electricity mm -hmm. prices, which was Ooh. double the rate of inflation. So that's right there is a huge opportunity for savings for, for folks that are making smart but small investments to, you know, install LED, LED lights, maybe um, smart thermostats, things like that that can make a material difference. Um, relatively quickly. Um, so really, I think that's been our focus is making it very practical, right. very easy to use, um, and helping franchisees find those opportunities to either and well, both drive savings and, you know, get get that top line revenue by appealing to those customers that we're talking about. Right. Because uh, we know the business is out there. Yeah, because uh, obviously sustainability is an essential part of everything. Dean made mention of it when it comes to making sure you could save when it comes to meeting planners. General consumers care about it, particularly younger millennials and Gen Z uh, folks. I hear my kids talking about that all the time. I was just proud in the late 80s when uh, I got my parents to start recycling. But you have to start <laughs> somewhere, right? Brian, you're dealing with... Uh, you've got a lot of properties all <clears throat> over the world and all these different jurisdictions and probably different ways of thinking about bringing sustainable um, success to each of those different regions. How are you thinking about it in general? And maybe what are the nuances that you're thinking about between like the United States, between uh, Canada, where you have so many Fairmont hotels, for example, and that sort of thing? Yeah, well, you know, to tie on to what John was saying as well, I think something, yeah. and Megan as well is, you know, um, it's not only, I think, just a simple matter that Gen Z are willing to pay more. You know, mm -hmm. I think something that, you know, the topic of climate change, the topic of sustainability, mm -hmm. very um, personal to them because they know it's going to affect them more. Um, they're more educated on those impacts and they understand that, you know, it's not just about paying more for this product. It's that if I get a higher quality product, um, there's going to be lesser negative impacts in the future that I'm going to have to deal with. Um, and I think a big part there is that, you know, something that maybe is missing in the other generations, including mine, I mean, later end millennials, it, yeah. it's a little controversial topic regardless. Um, you know, a big part of it is education, you know, and trying to explain to customers or explain to the franchise or explain to the hotel managers, you know, th that one of the reasons why there might be differences in cost, you know, is that you know, there's this, there's this concept that in, in a lot of tech companies called like tech debt, right? Mm -hmm. Where they put a lot of resources trying to get the minimum valuable product out. And what ends up what ends up happening is that they get something to market really quickly. Right. right? There's a lot of faults in how it's made. There's a lot of faults in the supply chain. And one of the things that sustainability right now is, uh, you know, it, it gets a lot of flack, I think, for being more expensive. When in reality, that's what the cost should have been all along right if you want a sustainable product if you want something that's fair trade um like a good example is coffee right like if you get like a, a low quality coffee like yeah that's going to be cheap right but if you want to have a sustainable product you know that's fair trade certified um that's you know like 100 percent blend from one location that's going to cost more money it's also a higher quality product that's having less impact right. on the, the environment um i think as well like you know the differences between the states and like canada i mean one of the big things is just um, you know, regulations, right? And there's a lot of regulations that you have to keep in mind when you're trying to source quality product or things that you need to keep ahead of when it comes to being able to properly forecast what prices might be in the next year, you know, and you have to be a little bit strategic and you have to keep an eye on what's coming down the pipeline. Like I know something that's really been at the forefront recently is I'm like Prop 12, right? That got passed in California um, and it went to the Supreme Court and that went through as well, where you know, we're going to see some higher prices in pork um, because there's no, they're mandating more space for these animals, right? And that may not be something that's happening in Canada right now. Right. But, you know, when that happens in a state like California, you know, it forces change in all of the other states as well. That's right? true. And what they say is where, uh, wherever California goes, the rest of the nation uh, follows because that, they're yeah. like the, the number six economy globally if you were to separate it from the United States. So, yeah. And then, you know, when they pass those kinds of legislation, it, it paves the road for more legislation to come down, right? There's another one um, in Massachusetts, it's called like question three, which is basically mm -hmm. similar to Prop 12. Right. Um, that was on hold until Prop 12 went through. Um, and you know, it's something where you need to be a little bit strategic, where even if you think something might not pass or not, you need to be able to try and forecast that to the hotel, say, hey, this is a possibility that might come down the road. Um, if you're not on top of those things, you know, the hotels, the restaurant, they can be they can be hit with um, very large increases to their budget that they just weren't anticipating before. Interesting. Um, 
Yeah. So, so I do think you, yeah, go on. You can yeah, no, so I think a big part is education, right? And making sure yep. that you know you're keeping an eye on that legislation that's coming through because without that education, without that why of why it's more expensive, mm -hmm. um, it's very easy to be accused of, you know, like this is just more expensive because we can charge more. Like it's more expensive because it's sustainable. Right. Uh, particularly in the political background we're, we're seeing now with the way that inflation has been going and with so many companies saying corporate profits are high at the expense of consumers, et cetera, et cetera. But that's not what this topic is. So I'm get Dean, I want to get back to you in that regard. How do you balance the needs of your owners, your customers, and this notion that Brian's talking about. You want to bring great quality coffee, for example, in this example, but you can only spend so much on it, but you could also use it as a marketing tool if done properly. How do you kind of balance all of these different things in order to come up with the proper solution for each category in food and beverage? Well, I think, you know, John touched on it saying that, uh, you know, people will pay for the quality. If the quality is there and it's known and you, you're really putting it out, you're doing, you know, a, a great presentation, it's, it's great food, it tastes great, the bar, whatever it is, um, but making sure that, you know, you're still making money, you're being profitable, and uh, they, they will pay for it. It's going to cost you more to bring all of this stuff in. It's all more expensive. Yep. You know, it used to be you wanted to get the cheapest you know, to go container you could get, and it was 13 cents, you know, and now you're paying, you know, you're paying 75 cents for a compostable, but that's what you have to do. You, you know, you just can't keep, we can't keep doing what we've been doing and thinking that we're going to make a change because it's not going to happen. Yep. So you, you, we've got to really commit to really, you know, holding ourselves accountable and, and I think, you know, you're right about, you know, how do we explain to ownership and, and you know, to our, our people when the p ls come out, but you can, like, like John was saying, they, they will pay. Um, you can increase your prices incrementally um, and keep an eye on things. And then you, you have to, you have to be smart with what you're doing. You know, you right. talk about, you know, right, right size protein portions. You know, we don't need massive 16 ounce 14 ounce steaks when uh, speak people, for yourself dean i don't know <laughs> <laughs> but you are you're I'm not you're saying i don't need them no but, but you're absolutely absolutely right dean and just yeah. to uh, i'll let you continue in a second but just to help the audience understand since the 1960s the portion of the average american plate has more than doubled in size that's why a lot of us are uh, eating too many calories because it's just right there and i don't know about you but i was a proud member of the clean plate club that my yeah. mommy started. So I was very excited <laughs> as a kid to have that. So that's an interesting point, what you're you're saying there as well, Dean, please continue. Yeah, no, I, and I, I just think that it's, uh, you know, we have to be conscious about what we're putting on the plates, mm -hmm. you know, and, and looking at what's coming back, you know, and that used to be an old, old chef thing. And that's how we kind of dictated, you know, is it, are they eating everything? And, and, you know, they, they're not. And, and if they are, then maybe they're eating too much. And it's up to us to educate. And we right. have to educate everybody from the very, you know, dishwasher stewards all the way up to, you know, the meeting contacts and the, the yep. directors of sales and catering directors on how this is going to work. Uh, yeah. So, uh, John, one of the cool things about um, working with someone like you in, in, in procurement is you have the opportunity to buy large amounts of product, which probably helps reduce the uh, the costs over there, right? So, um, how do you think about elevating quality, doing the right thing ethically, maybe when it comes to, uh, to, to meats, for example, and making sure that that message is clear and can be used as a success tool for hoteliers like Dean? Yeah, I appreciate that question. Um, but let me put this in the paradigm of, of sort of, let's go 30,000 foot for a second. I'm gonna mm -hmm. introduce something that I know we've all heard of, but I don't hear it spoken about enough. And I wanna yeah. challenge our audience to just think this way. Think about both upstream and downstream recycling. Now let's apply what that means. So really mm -hmm. in a manufacturing paradigm, what that means is, you're looking at using uh, post-consumer materials to then create something brand new from it. Let's just mm -hmm. make that simple. That's upstream and downstream is then what do you do with it once it's been consumed? Am I recycling again? So upstream and downstream. So 
as a as a big opportunity as a hotel which has a lot more of its own controls over energy use and so forth this statistic is probably not uh, perfect but it's close so yeah. roughly a business is operating on about two-thirds of its sustainability is dictated by its suppliers think about that for a minute mm -hmm. so it's all the stuff that comes in the back door which is really affecting sustainability or not so again, I say, I'm saying askew because hotels are so large and have right. some rooms and lots of water consumption. But the challenge there then is to apply that upstream and downstream to ourselves. Mm -hmm. So think about everything you're bringing in. Are your, are your uh, Dean, you mentioned, are you selecting a good packaging company that's providing you with product that is coming from post-consumer? Are you selecting uh, produce that's in season? Are you selecting meats that are raised in um, responsible uh, avenues that are, yeah. they themselves are selecting sustainable practices? So that's your upstream notification. The rest, I think we're all starting to get, okay? Not starting, we've all gotten like, how do we recycle? How do we check those programs? Some of them are auditable. You can check, are they really recycling or are they mm -hmm. just dumping into one hole? That's a, that's a project I think everyone should take on with their waste removal system is to do yeah. that audit and really check into it. So all of that to say that working with a group like Integra Procurement Services, our customers and partners rest assured that we vetted these businesses already, that we've taken the time to check DE&I, we've taken yeah. the time to see how upstream is happening at our manufacturers. Um, we have a packaging group uh, that we represent and that's one of our partnered uh, contract suppliers. They, they daily practice the reduce, reuse, recycle, and renew mentality. And they've got product, for example, that might be a to-go packaging that they literally have um, used sterilized earth or minerals or clay and so forth mm -hmm. to mm. disperse half of the polymer in a package. So wow. it, it's just flat out 50% less polymer in a package. So. If things like that we really take note of and when we're selecting a, a supplier for our partners to participate in we've done that homework we're bringing you something that's women and, and minority owned uh companies that are really practicing the up and downstream recycling but that was my challenge just think upstream downstream look it up call us call me for more information but it's something that i would challenge our audience to check into yeah, I definitely want to talk about uh, specific suppliers and stuff. So, uh, Megan, when you're thinking about these issues, recycling and whatnot, one of the things that I think about is your vast pool of suppliers that you have out there that are helping supply 7,500 hotels, you know, that you guys uh, op operate. I bet you're thinking about how you can see how their products are made, how their services are done in order to be able to make sure things are sustainable in a way that your individual operators and franchisees don't have to do all of that research. Absolutely. You know, that's one of the advantages of scale, right? Is mm -hmm. we have the opportunity to, to use our resources to hopefully benefit, you know, the broader ecosystem of all of the owners that are part of our portfolio. Yeah. And also use our scale to, to develop, you know, better pricing and make sure that they're getting the most competitive offering. So that is certainly a focus for us. Um, and, and, you know, John's right, there's a lot of things that you can look at from your suppliers and, and the data that you can get from them as far as their DE&I practices, their environmental policies and impact, human rights policies. And these are all data points that we are working with our suppliers to gather. So we've got a, a you know, a better assessment of where the opportunities might be, some of the risks. And we can also use that to have really constructive dialogue with our with our suppliers. I'll give you um, an example. So we uh, just recently refreshed our Cambria brand prototype, and the team was really focused on bringing some sustainable sustainability um, related FF&E items into that prototype because that very much appeals to the the guest for that brand. Yep. And what was interesting is they were able to find opportunity either cost neutral or in some cases actually a cost reduction wow. for a better product. Now it's not always easy, right? right. It's not every product, right. but I think um, as you get more of this data, you can start to find more of those win-win situations, which is really what we all want. Um, and, and there are trade-offs sometimes. Sometimes you may have to pay a little bit more for one item, but you can actually achieve savings in another category. The other thing I just wanted to mention around um, supply chain that I think is an interesting trend that's starting to emerge in this field 
is um, I'm seeing more and more focus on partnerships and ways that um, creative partnerships can help solve problems for multiple for multiple parties. You see it um, today with many of the EV charging companies that are partnering with various retail partners to grow their distribution. Um, and sometimes it's a three three uh, person or a three company par uh, partnership, right. which I think is really creative. Um, we just recently had an example of this at our Radisson Blue Mall of America uh, mm -hmm. property. Um, we were very happy that that facility became the first hotel in the world to have a new um, type of technology called Carbon X. And that um, unit actually is installed, it's live today. And what it does is it's it's a small scale carbon capture device. It attaches to the hotel's water heater. Mm. So it actually helps the hotel lower the, the cost of heating their water. At the same time, it's sucking out uh, carbon dioxide. So it's capturing that carbon and producing a useful byproduct in the form of pearl ash. This was a, this was a three-way partnership between us, the brand, the hotel team, um, uh, the local utility provider, and the technology provider. So it was a really interesting um, opportunity. It didn't cost the hotel any money to install it because that mm -hmm. was paid for out of the utility provider's R&D budget. Cool. And the hotel's getting the benefit. They've got a great story to tell guests. And they're doing good, right? They're taking carbon out of the air. They're capturing carbon that otherwise would have gotten emitted from their um, from their boiler system. So I think there's really an opportunity as we think about supply chain to start to stitch together more right. of these innovative partnerships to help drive some some great solutions in the states. And John, carbon is uh, very relevant when it comes to food and beverage too, because I always go back to the uh, you know everyone's got to have their strawberries in February. Right. And I'm a New Yorker and I know most of them are grown in California. Maybe I shouldn't have strawberries then. Right. It would do a lot of good for the environment. But I also don't want to, you know, hurt the strawberry farmer out there. So how are you? Uh, how are you approaching thinking about sustainability when it comes to uh, car uh, carbon being uh, utilized? Yeah. So excellent question. And I think um, aside from. Yes. The, the beauty of our company is that we're global. We take a lot of notes from our European yeah. partners or, or our European counterparts that mm -hmm. they actually live that lifestyle pretty happily and successfully. So there's no weeping and sobbing uh, in the wintertime when the strawberries aren't present. Well, maybe um, not in your house over here. There's, <laughs> there's, a, lot of, there's the, a lot of it. Um, but, but living that lifestyle, challenging the chef, you know, uh, listen, I heard something the other day when in the middle of all this economy, the challenges of what we're talking about, because again, I'm gonna say this again, this isn't easy. I'm agreeing with my panelists, partners. It's not easy, it's hard work. But someone said, man, I can't remember the last time I worked this hard. And I, I've been saying this a bit, but it's just a reminder to us all. Yes, you do. You do remember it was when you were a freshman in this industry, your first year or two yeah. in, and you had more pens in your pocket and a notepad in your back pocket, and you're, you're right on the ball of everything you were doing, you were working really hard. So work like a freshman. Uh, that's my advice to everyone. But yes, it's the work on the chef to uh, embrace the seasons without a doubt. Um, mm -hmm. And then we've we've aligned with produce suppliers with our, our local and direct programs, which are very uh, skewed to making sure that they're pulling from local source farmers and that's critical. Uh, Yes, of course, we're going to have to move celery around the country. It grows yeah. really well in one part of the country. But as much as we can, you know, working with a national group supplier like ourselves or rather international, uh, you can rest assured that we're doing a lot of the homework for the operator. But at the right. same time, I say, you know, embrace everything that's at your resources and, and look to those local opportunities as a chef, as a menu developer, uh, local as possible, seasonal as possible. I think those are the best ways to consider that opportunity. Uh, Listen, John, I will see what you're seeing and raise you a little bit, because I think if you fully embrace the seasons and create a flexible menu, then yeah. what you're probably talking about is increasing the appeal to the guests. Now, you're always going to have to have the burger or whatever standard things that people come in for. But Brian, how are you thinking about this particular aspect of it? Because if you're creating, um, it's a lot more work, but you're creating menus that are highly localized and specialized. Not only is that better for the universe, but my, again, my hunch is it's better for the customer. They're going to like that sort of thing more. Yeah. Well, I think uh, John made a good point there about yeah. you know, challenging the chef. Um, I think one thing though, you know, it's like, it's not just challenge the chef, but also trust the chef. 
I mean, they're creative individuals. They've been, they're professionals. They've been doing this for many years. You know, and it's kind of, you know, um, you have to trust that there will be, they will be able to make magnificent dishes and magnificent menus with what's available. It's part of their job. Right. Part of that trust. And, you know, when it comes to food waste as well and carbon emissions, those are very closely together linked, right? I mean, if food waste was a country, it would have the third highest emissions in the entire world. I think right? something like one third of all food produced is basically wasted, right? Pretty much, exactly. Right. So yeah. I know the stats in the States, it's like it's about 40% of food produced is wasted. I know it's a lot higher in yep. Canada, it's like 50% of food produced wow. is wasted. Um, hospitality industry, I think the stat is around 25% of food purchased um, is thrown away. And, you know, I think this is a really key point when when there's concerns about the rise of price in food. Um, a, you know, Megan mentioned inflation earlier with gas prices. You know, food itself, you know, like in Canada, we had 5% inflation last month compared to the year before. Food, mm -hmm. however, was 10%, right? So food is inflating at a much higher price um, than most other products. And a way that these that way that these costs can be recouped and more can be spent on quality products is by looking at what's coming in as well as going out, right? I mean, I think one of the things that's really interesting about food is that there's a lot of different touch points where you can reduce that waste, right? You can reduce how much you're ordering by doing proper forecasting, knowing who's coming in, what you need to purchase. Um, you can look at what's being wasted in prep. Um, and, and that could be a metric that chefs can use to see how efficient you know, the different cooks in the in the kitchen are. Um, you can see how much food is coming back on the plate, how much food is being thrown away. And it can be very easy sometimes to see this food waste solution and think, oh, we have all this food waste. We need to get these digesters in, or we need to get these dehydrators in, or we need to get all of these products that come at the end of the chain so that we spend less money on landfills or something. When in reality, a lot more of that money can be saved by just not buying that product in the first place, right? And so- right. If you're throwing away 25% of your food, you know, reducing that down to 10% or 5%, well, that 10% increased inflation doesn't really, it's not that big of a problem anymore. And it allows you to still put more money into quality ingredients. I love what you're saying. John? Yeah, just a quick comment on that. You nailed it, Brian. I was really proud of your answer sincerely about chefs take a lot of pride the gals and guys I've worked with for the last 38 years or so now in doing this, um, a lot of pride, a lot of knowledge, a lot of studying goes into what we do as chefs. Um, on the food waste, I'll throw there uh, just a notion to everyone to do a little research on Lean Path. In, in hot the hotel world where there's so much catering, so much high volume preparation, food prep is such a big deal that uh, there's a, a program out there, Lean Path, that's a strategic partner of ours that um, just be creates a behavior of real awareness of your waste. Like you're weighing the before and after. I can weigh a case of onions or a, a case of tomatoes as I'm about to prep way after and really look at that waste. It's, it's not fixing the physicality of the waste. It's creating a social and a mental awareness of how we prep and what we prep and have maybe just uh, the knife cuts or the machineries that we're the machinery that we're using on how efficiently are we removing the uned or the inedible part that's a really important thing to throw in there and i would one thing i'd like to throw in there john is um you've really got me in the mood for a pizza with that amazing <laughs> oven behind you uh, over there as well uh you can take down your your hand great dean let me uh, let me throw this to you then uh Fascinating what they're all all saying. One area where I think food reduction has been successful, and again, I'm just speaking as an outsider, mm -hmm. is the shift when you're looking at catering for events on property. You move away from big giant troughs of food to individualized portions. I suspect that gives more control. Have you done stuff like that? And what are some of the other things that you've implemented in order to be able to handle this issue and find success through it? Sure. No, um, yeah, we are doing that at at almost all of our hotels right now where we're right. we're really, you know, on our new orders for new builds, we're, we're eliminating the purchase of large shaping units and things right. like that. And let me just say, I, I think it really up, ups the event quality Absolutely. as far as the consumer feels, right? Yeah, so please continue. Perceived, Thank you. The perceived saying. high quality and freshness of the product. So doing mm -hmm. the individual portions and, and having it really well displayed and put out there you know, sometimes you're going to have to have a body out there with it, you know, when you're doing an action station. Yeah. It's very controlled and 
you know, we've, we've been doing this for a while and the amount of product that you use, it's so much less than, you know, the, the big troughs, like you said, the buffet. Yeah. And I, I think the, you know, coming up in the industry, having, you know, you have to have 5% over the counts and things like that. Um, that that's going away. And right. that's part of that education process where you're talking to the meeting planner hey, mm -hmm. listen, in, an, in an effort to reduce our food waste, you know, we might, we're going to run very close based, yep. based on, you know, the, the chef's expertise and expectation on what he's producing in production. So right. we will have food to feed everyone, but it might change for the last 10 people. We might, you know, do a, a different type of meat or a beef. Right. Or something like that. But it's, it's, it's all part of that education process. And uh, definitely want to get away from the big giant containers. Right. You know, two gallons of. Uh, uh, John, let me uh, let me throw this back to you real quick. So I'm thinking when you got the big giant containers of food. Now I'm just you know I, I don't mean to brag, but I've been to a lot of buffets in, in my <laughs> life, right? But uh, one of the things that I've seen is I think people have a natural inclination to take a big scoop of something because of the size of the spoon or the ladle or whatever it might be. So you are automatically probably losing a big percentage of food just with that alone. So this, right, Dean, I see you're you're totally yeah, uh, on board with what crazy. I'm saying. Yeah. Right. So I think that's an interesting thing. So, um, John, I want to uh, ask you this question. And before I ask you a question, I want to throw one out there. If you have a question, I haven't seen any yet. Ask us. Not We're yet. here to help <laughs> you. John, what I'm thinking is, we're talking about lowering the amount of stuff. We're talking about the supply chain for profitability and sustainability and all that. But everybody's desire to eat has now fractured, right? There's a lot more vegetarians out there. Every other person is gluten-free. So people are allergic to this. They're allergic to the other thing. They all want stuff that's different. So now instead of having two items, you have to have a lot more items. But how do you balance the need to serve all of those customers with more selections of food to appeal to everyone while actually being a conscious mind and optimizing that food and beverage supply chain and stuff? <clears throat> well, let me let me spark my brain matter because you yeah. asked a lot of questions in one there and it's yeah brilliant. i tend to do that, <laughs> that. <laughs> uh, i need a little caffeine or something hold on um no i, I get where you're going with that and yeah. i think what's most important is to i don't want to say um don't ever feel like you're ever going to please every single person that walks in the door mm -hmm. um I, I always say uh pick the things that you're good at become great at those things and be willing to admit when you're when you don't do something well right um the other side of that is to contemplate um some of the i want to call them more convenience items that are i don't want to say prepackaged, but let's just say i've seen a tremendous surge in the quality level of a beautiful grass-fed angus burger mm -hmm. that using that plus technology uh something like mary chef or speed oven something along those lines how quickly i can pull off a uh, a vegetarian patty with a, a vegan bun and some vegan cheese in a fast cooking environment not only as a hotel not only does that give me flexibility on the menu uh, i have a machine that can be dedicated specifically to gf and vegetarian but it also opens me up for after hours uh, menu opportunities that I can run an entire late mm -hmm. night menu out of one of these machines with somebody who's not a chef, but I've got pre-portioned, ready to go. Here's my nighttime menu. So I think the best way to answer some of what you're saying is be great at what you're great at. Don't always say yes to every single thing. I know that goes against a lot of hospitality right. mentality, but we're all talking change here. So I'm saying be willing to change a little bit and don't pull something off halfway. You all know what I was about to say, halfway. I'm using that term, mm -hmm. but don't pull something off halfway just to appease. Figure out how you can do it great. Use technology. Cooking technology has come a long way. And being on the supply side, I wanna give my partners again on this, on this panel, the assurance that things like GF, product quality is going like this, you guys. Things like uh, plant-based uh, analogs, proteins that are designed to look like meat. Um, those are really for us who are trying to eat healthier, not for the true vegan who, why would they want to eat it if it looks like meat? They don't want meat. But right. 
all of these products, the quality is just excessively going through the roof. They're really getting better and better. Uh, so I think the availability is there. And when it's one of our partners here as an operator has the opportunity or has a desire to tap into this kind of menu work, that's why we're here. That's the dynamic of a GPO mm -hmm. is having a powerful culinary team that will do a lot of that homework for you and bring you the answers you need with excellent product behind uh, the, the ink right. I love that. And I happen to be uh, not a big fan of, uh, of vegetarian cuisine masquerading as meats. Be proud <laughs> of what you are. I've had Indian food. I know you can have the best food on the planet uh, oh, and not have meat in it, right? Absolutely. So I think part of the issue is we have to educate people that you can find great vegetarian food. It's just that for my whole you know, growing up, it's like, here's a salad or here's a side dish of broccoli. You're going to be happy about <laughs> it. Right. Um, you know, Megan, um, I want to take this uh, back to you. Now, I know um, that food and beverage is becoming an increasingly important part of it since the uh, the Radisson acquisition out there. So you're probably starting to change things a, a little bit. What kind of updates are you thinking about now with your room to be green certification program when it comes to this stuff? Yeah, absolutely. So we've been really focused on um, refreshing our, our Room to be Green program, which is our hotel-facing certification program. So it's, it's really designed to help hotels progress step-by-step -step on their sustainability journey. Much like companies, we know that hotels are all at a different starting point, right? Some of them may be leaders that have been doing this for years, and they've got the solar panels on the roof, and they're already, you know, um, composting and all of those great things. Others may be at the beginning. So this is really meant to help hotels progress step by step. And as part of what we've been doing to redesign that program, we have spent a lot of time doing research on what are the data points that are showing up in corporate RFPs? What are those, what are those corporate clients asking for? Yep. Um, and we're seeing that it's pretty broad. Yes, I mean, they, they want things like carbon footprint, but they also want to know what are your food offerings? Do you have vegetarian off offerings? Um, they're interested in that. What do, do you have plastics or are you have you moved away from plastics on property? So we're seeing that kind of um, those questions show up. And so we've designed um, best practices and brand standards into our program to help hotels meet those increased expectations. Um, so that's that's certainly one thing that has been yeah. a focus. The other has been, um, you know, we're seeing more and more of these third party certifications around eco friendly hotels. Mm -hmm. If you if you go on, you know, any of the OTAs now, you'll see there are different filters for hotels that are getting marked as eco friendly. So again, we're looking at these third party certifications and saying, what does a hotel need to do in order to get one of those certifications, and how can we help? help them progress on that path. And it, it can be, again, it's a range of things, whether it's energy usage, water usage, um, biodiversity. You know, we've seen hotels that are focused on native plants um, instead of Good. lawns, um, which yeah. is great, you know, especially in, you know, water stressed areas in the Southwest and so forth. Um, so really thinking strategically about what are those revenue drivers and how do we build it into the program so that ultimately hotels can use that to go capture more business and, and bring in more customers. Yeah, I think one of the things that Megan is saying is the, it's the whole notion of rethinking conventional thinking. Just because we've done things one way in the past doesn't mean that we need to stick to it. I love what you said about the lawns. Las Vegas has done a great job of incentivizing people to get rid of their lawns in terms of, you know, having natural plants there that belong in the uh, the area. So that makes a whole lot of sense to me. Brian, I want to bring you back in over here with what she's saying. How are you thinking about programs in the Accor family that ensure that you have a good starting point when you're dealing with diversity of, uh, of thought, diversity of product, diversity of people that own companies? Yeah, well, you know, I think Megan did again bring up a really good point where, you know, a big part of this is looking at third party certifications and what they're looking at because they can really help hotels understand you know what is more material to them than if they're in another area right because like a hotel yep. that might be in a desert is not going to have the same concern right. as a hotel that might be in a natural park for example right nor so, should it right exactly it, it shouldn't and if it, if it did then you were doing something wrong right mm -hmm. it, it, you're you're not getting that best case scenario or even a good scenario in some cases like a good example is you know um, like there's certainly some hotels that will use, you know, like organic digesters and they'll put the food waste into the sewers or whatever, right? But if you're in a natural park, for example, where you might not have those same kind of municipal um, infrastructure put in place, you can't do that kind of thing, right? 
Um, so third party certifications are a really big thing. Um, another one is just doing measurements. You know, you can't make improvements if you're not measuring it. Um, you know, we do make use of different tools such as like Ecovadis, um, which helps us analyze our suppliers, you know, see what policies they have, what actual actions they're putting in place and what the results are. But the big thing behind those third party certifications and working with these other companies that are experts in doing this kind of measurement is that you're able to get a bespoke, um, a bespoke solution to a unique problem, right? Um, so I think that's a really important um, aspect to keep in mind. Um, and it's very similar with food as well, right? Like, you know, if your hotels are in different locations, you know, and you have that commitment to local food, it serves two purposes. One, yep. you're, support, you're supporting your local community, but also, you know, you're making use of a product that's in your region. You know, your product is being transported less distances. It has higher quality when it reaches you. Um, so I think that's really something that has to be pushed very hard is the idea that there is no one size fits all solution. Right. And you need to keep an eye on what all these different possible technologies are out there, you know? Yeah, uh, Dean, he, he makes a great point um, in regards to that local aspect uh, of it. So um, why wouldn't you want to go that uh, way, absolutely. right? Absolutely. And I, I think, uh, you know, one thing that we we need to take more advantage of, and John, you're going to love this. I think, uh, you know, working with our, our purchasing programs, because they have all of the the they they know what's out there right yeah. chefs you know we we know what we see and we know what you know we read about or what's local or whatever but you guys working with a gpo or a purchasing program um to really source local and to really you know whether it's a bakery you guys can find it you know a local fish or cheese uh produce and then and then use those folks and really create a true partnership with the local farmers. Put their names on the menus, right? Um, have them come in. I think one of the most impactful things that you can do is let let the these small producers and 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 farmers let them see how you're using their product, right? And then, I mean, believe me, you're gonna you're gonna get that back threefold. They're gonna they. They're going to really kind of elevate their level of care of what they're giving you when their name is on the menu. Yes. Um, and then, the, and then you you have chefs that are creating these hyper seasonal menus, so it's constantly changing, you know. And that goes back to like what Brian was saying about making sure that we change our menus mm -hmm. so we are staying within that local footprint as much as possible. Um, right. And I just think it's a it's a huge opportunity for for all of us to kind of you know take advantage right. of the tools that are right there Huge opportunity indeed, because after all, uh, all the major hotel companies and most people within hospitality over the last 15 years or so have really been focused on local, right? <laughs> it all started with creating different designs that gives uh, owners and operators more flexibility for how the properties are looking. Now it's expressing themselves in the in the granular level of the food that's there. John, that's why I love having the names on the menu. I think it connects you to the community in a more meaningful way while also going back to the other point explains why something might be a little bit more expensive and giving the consumer permission to say, yeah, I'm okay with that because it's the local business and I know the quality is better and it's helping my community or the community I'm visiting. How do you see that? Yeah, no, uh, that's one of the keys I mentioned earlier too, I think is so important mm -hmm. is just that communication element yeah. is what are those communication standards? Is it as simple as a menu mention? Is it something in the bio of the organization or the bio of the hotel that gives mm -hmm. a little bit of the credo and that mentality that we carry? And, and I can see being an operator again in my mind, uh, you know, what, what transforms our day to day? What makes us dedicated? What makes us committed to this is really a longer uh, lifespan to everything we do, including our world. Um, and that sustains into the relationship we have with those consumers. They're going to come back. Um, I've got something else I want to say a little later when we get to it, but that's that return customer is one of the biggest infolds I can say into what we're all talking about today is it's a continued commitment. They're going to come back to the brands that are practicing these things. There are other brands that may not be practicing or at least not communicating as clearly. Every great relationship is even better with better communication. So I say 
communicate really clearly and really well to your consumer, to your customers, as I think they're going to step up and be that repeat customer. And uh, back in my ops days, I always told my staff up front, don't look at a customer as somebody new coming in that you're going to sell them $100 worth of food. Yeah. Look at them as two or three or $4,000 that you might get if you win them over and get them in all year long. Yep. Yeah, I love it. Megan? Just thinking about local, you know, I think uh, one of the reasons why there has been so much of an increased focus on this is it's really an opportunity to, to tell a story. And like humans, yeah. at the end of the day, we want that. to we want to be part of a story. You know, before I was a sustainability person, I was a brand person. And so I, I know how much stories matter um, and they help provide a sense of connection to the local place, the local people. And I think for many travelers who might be traveling a lot, the road warriors or even the occasional traveler, they want to feel that connection. That's part of the reason for going is to feel that connection. And so um, whether it's putting the name of the farmer on the menu or whether it's, you know, something that sits in the guest room, a piece of collateral that tells that hotel's story, I think it's just a great way to engage customers and help them feel excited to be part of it. Yeah, absolutely. Anyone want to add to what? Oh, Brian. Yeah. Yeah. No. So I think again, that's I love the hand great. raising thing, by the way. You know, but um, I think again, like that story is really important, right? Like I know, yeah. and the Dean's point as well, like bringing these suppliers in um, to have these better conversations and build these partnerships. Um, it's something that makes your hotel or makes your establishment more authentic to that community. Um, like I know something that we've done in the past few months is, you know, we, we invite these diverse suppliers. We invite local suppliers from the community to our hotels because we want them to meet the people at the hotel who are making these purchasing decisions, right? We want them to, you know, it, it gives them as, as well a, a better footing to actually get business with us as well. Because, you know, one of the biggest disadvantages that these small businesses or minority-owned businesses might have is that, you know, they, they simply don't have that same relationship that an incumbent supplier would have. Right. And that's a really big thing to overcome. And, you know, overcoming that is part of the story. Um, it builds that closer tie. Like one of the suppliers that we um, are, are working to build better connections with is, you know, is, is like local distilleries in like San Francisco. You know, like if you're in San Francisco, if you're in California, you know, why would you not want to drink something that's produced in that area? Like, why would you go to San Francisco? That's right. You to buy a product that is made in New York or some other faraway country. Like, why not just travel to that country? Well, like, I would argue New York makes the best of everything. So. Sure, but again, yeah. you know, but other than that, where, I, yeah. you know, if, if you're visiting a certain area, yeah. the idea is that you can experience that area better, you know, when you know that that food is made locally, when you know it's made by the people locally and right. spend those people and then it, it incentivizes those customers to return again because they know that they are they're putting in resources into that community that will make the next experience even better you know absolutely i am on the board of the long island hospitality association since i live on long island and i just had the opportunity to visit a distillery about 10 minutes from my house first of all i love yeah. that there's a distillery so close but it's also they've done partnerships with um long island is known for wines now and beers. So they've made partnerships with all of that. So you go to this location and all you get are local spirits. And I think that is absolutely phenomenal. And it really roots you more in the area. And I would argue everybody that it probably engenders you more to the uh, the brand at the, uh, the end of the day. We got a great question. And thank you for asking this question before we run out of time. A lot of great information shared today about goals. Some may be easier said than able to accomplish. What are the biggest challenges you panelists are facing today themselves or at the franchisee owner level? John, you want to start with that one? Absolutely. Uh, excellent question. Um, to, you know, to hear from other people, I think collaboration is really key uh, to expounding on intelligence and, and such an opportunity. I've learned I, my notes are full from everybody on the panel today. So thank you for the opportunity once again. Um, you know, let's let's just talk about the one thing we haven't brought up um, is people and labor. Mm -hmm. um, different angle to this. I want to. Is there an is there a labor issue that we should be? <laughs> uh, no, not at all. Um, <laughs> this is only but, the fifth uh, time I'm talking about it today. Right. So, <laughs> go on, John. I, I would I would challenge everyone to look up something yeah. called fair, fairkitchens.com. Mm -hmm. um, I learned about this through our long term contractual partnership with Unilever. They've been a big part of creating this. Um, it's, I'll be very simple here. It's, it's just designed to uh, uh, create 
working environments that are safe, that are uh, inclusive, that are dedicated to staff, um, where there is not a, an uber structure of a big corporation that helps that smaller to mid-sized company with a really formalized uh, structured working environment training that had been um, certified by the CIA. There's a certificate that comes to junior staff members. This is all free, by the way. Right. You're talking about the Killer Learning Institute of America, not yeah. the, the operations of course, overseas yeah. of the U.S. government. <laughs> yeah. Okay. But, um, certification that comes to the junior managers that want to take on this type of training, and it's really wholesome stuff. It's very wholesome. And why I'm bringing that up, you know, talk sustainability of, of labor and people right now. They have to be treated well. They have to feel that they're safe. That the, the they, kitchen they has were, not been known for that historically. No, it hasn't yeah. been. And especially, you know, what's happened over the last few years, yeah. uh, they were shut down on. And we lost a lot of them that will never come back. So what's yeah. great is we're getting a lot of new, right? A lot of uh, occupational changers mm -hmm. coming in. And uh, I love this because it really gives a sense of, ownership, participation, uh, you know, just think about what we talked about, about sustainability and how we can communicate to that to our customers. There will be a day where people are going to look for that little sticker on your door that says, this is a Fair Kitchen's Kitchen. Uh, it's yep. certified. They've gone through the training. The people who come in here have a smile on their face every day. They know they're, they're working to a sustainable job that's going to treat them well. It's really important, not just raises and increases. It's not always about money. If one thing I could say that I've learned in the 38 years now of this industry is the people who are in it for the money, they're gone. Yep. It's just the truth. Those are the ones that left. The people who are in it because they have hospitality as a gift or they love serving people, those are the ones that stayed and who are coming on. So those are people who being, being treated well matters to really, really profoundly. So I would just say that's the that's a very esoteric way to look at labor, but I'm just challenging, open your hearts, look at your staff, treat them well. They'll be there for a long time if you do that. And right. check out Fair Kitchens. I think it's pretty cool. Awesome. All right. So we're really starting to run low on time. And now you guys are asking your questions. Where were we 20 minutes ago? All right. One quick question. <laughs> um, uh, I'll, I'll address this one to Dean. Um, how do you overcome the perception of cost savings when it comes to buffet for the cost conscious clients? And they're talking about, you know, the, the plated versus the big buffets. I think there is a feeling that if it's in a big container, it's got to be cheaper, right? Right. Well, and I think that's part of that education process. And it's part of the, you know, I, I put that onto the sales team that they sell that we can create what um, will make most everybody happy, right? And you have to appeal to that sense of sustainability. And, you know, we're doing this to, you know, we want to try to eliminate our food waste. And these are our, the great options that our chef has come up with. And it's, it's really having the confidence to make that sale. And to, I mean, you have to, you got to, you're mentally pushing them into your direction. And I think that's what we have to do. And, uh, you know, our, our chefs have to be creative mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, it, you, it might kill you, but you may have to do, you know, two or three different selections right. to do that. But in the end, you're still coming out ahead. You're not throwing stuff in the trash. I mean, I, I, you know, when this, when this opportunity came up for this panel, I started thinking about reflecting on, you know, my career and, the, just the amount of food that I personally have thrown away has kept me up. <laughs> and it's, it's just, it's ridiculous and it, it has to end. Um, and that's the responsible way to do it. Yeah. All right. Last question um, before we do some wrap ups, Brian, I'm going to ask you this one. How can you save time, money, and prevent food waste by using future inventory management systems, technology, they're getting at AI, machine learning, all of that kind of good stuff. Yeah, well, I mean, I think that ties into one of the previous questions, like what are one of the biggest challenges? Um, well, these tools, you know, well, biggest one of the biggest challenges is data, right? Yep. It's very hard to make insightful decisions if you do not have that data, if you don't have a means of tracking what's been wasted, what's been accurately been ordered, you know, being able to make those discrepancy reports, um, you know, being able to use an inventory management system, being able to use AI or machine learning. I mean, however they might apply that, I'm not sure. Like maybe you know, using machine learning or AI to help make better menus with what's available, that's something, but, um, you know, you can't make use of any of those tools 
unless you have good data. Anything that goes inside that, if it's bad data, you're going to get nonsense results. Um, and I think, you know, the, the push towards, you know, these different AIs or machine learning technologies, you know, it's going to drive a necessity that companies take care of their data and they respect that the information that's coming in or coming out, like it, it, they need to be able to trust that. Um, so I think that's one of the benefits that's going to come from these different tools that are coming out is that mm -hmm. companies are going to have a lot more respect for the, the, the management of their data. You know? Beautiful. Uh, so Megan, how about a good final thought? And then we'll go around to uh, everybody else. Take us home. Yeah, just a final thought. So, I, you know, as I as I have listened to other sustainability conversations and being part of this one, I I, I think Glenn, it might have been you who said earlier that you you got to start somewhere, and I think yep. that's really the key for no matter what discipline you're in, whether you're you know in the kitchen or you're behind the front desk or you're managing the hotel. There are so many opportunities. There's so much low hanging fruit still in this space to start to implement sustainability at your hotel. Right. And it does create a huge amount of attraction, both for customers as well as for your staff, because they want to feel like they're, some, they're part of something bigger. Um, so the key is just to get started. There's no perfect answer for where to get started. It really, you know, take a look at what's happening at your hotel, maybe have some conversations with your, your team and see what their ideas are, use it as a way to engage them. But the most important thing is to get started, um, because then once you start doing that, you start to see more yep. opportunities. You start to build the flywheel and you start to get that momentum going and, and more good things can happen. Yeah, it's just like that with all aspects of life. If you don't mm -hmm. start to make forward progress, you're never going to achieve the goals. And you break mm -hmm. down this big, scary thing into small, little bite-sized pieces. Dean, how about you? Uh, I'm kind of on the same lines as Megan. I think it's uh, it's it's just a matter of, just start, right? It doesn't need to be big and grandiose. It could be composting. It could be saving your waste and giving it to a pig farmer. But yep. make that start, make it happen, and and grow that culture. And I, yep. I think it's all culture and, and get everybody on board and it'll grow. Brian, how about you? Yeah, no, I mean, I agree with what everyone has said, you know, and as well, you know, maybe reframe what the challenge is. It's not just this product is more expensive. They're not like for like products. The more sustainable products is generally going to be better. The people making it are going to be happier. Uh, and that's something that, you know, can help tell that story. It's not just about price increase for the sake of it. It's a different product that is far better. Love it. John? Yeah, I think um, the biggest thing is starting, right? Um, it, right in lockstep with Megan and the others. I, I always, I taught years ago and I always say three things, you know, let's, let's talk about three things today. Well, if you're initiating something, maybe pick three simple things. It doesn't take an entire scrubbing and reconstituting of, of a workspace or a renovation to, to initiate some really great energy savings and so on. Um, prep at night, you know, do your heavy prep at night when electricity costs less. Right. Um, you know, installing uh, fixtures that uh, systematically sleep. Um, the next equipment purchase you make check into how energy efficient it is and is there a sleep mode if it's an oven and you've got a low a lot of conveyor ovens for example have a sleep mode where it goes down to about 50 percent power um, it could be as simple as that and anytime there's a, a repair needing to be done toilets that use less water and so on and so forth i think just initiating and having a, a viewpoint that these, this doesn't take for you to turn the world inside out to begin is so important to think that we can start simple, we can start profoundly, and we can start today. What a jam-packed panel we had today. I want to thank all of you guys for being here. That was great. And I want to thank all of you for watching today. And I think the big take-home message from today, it is achievable, but in the end, sustainability is much like the Borg from Star Trek. Resistance is futile. Now go out there, get your <laughs> programs together. Thank you so much for being here. Remember, this will be available on demand to you, covered in the July issue of Hotel Business. Check out hotelbusiness.com and while you're at it, why not stay at some incredible hotels from Accor, stay at some managed by Concord, stay at some but from Choice Hotels, and make sure you get all of your goods and supplies for food and beverage from Integra Procurement Services. And while you're at it, check out No Vacancy and go to NoVacancyNews.com. Thanks so much. So for Megan, Brian, John, and Dean, and myself, Glenn, have a wonderful afternoon, and we'll see you on another issue of Hot Topics coming up soon. Thanks so much, everyone. Cheers, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.